One year ago this morning, I stood here for the first time as a main resident and preached. And uh, <laughs> thank you for putting up with us, with me especially. Uh, but man, a year already. Isn't that incredible? It seemed like it took forever for the you know, year and a half that we were waiting to come and go. And now we've been here for a year already. And, and look around. Just take a second and look around, okay? I mean that. People are like, hey. I don't want people to see that I see them. What you see around you is a, is a work of God. Um, I, I, love, I love this. I love seeing how God has been working, not just in us as a church. I mean, they're, I mean we, we've grown in number, which is exciting, which is awesome. Um, how many of you have ever seen the movie Field of Dreams? Right. This Church of God is not a if you build it, they will come scenario. The body of Christ is if you preach the word of God and if you love one another as we are told to in the scriptures, um, people will come. If you live out the gospel, if you preach and teach the gospel and share the gospel, people will come. And so as you look around, uh, especially those of you who have been here for a long time or who were here in the years before we came, um, there's a lot of people here that were not here before. And so we, we praise God for all of those people and uh, for what God is doing in you. I get most excited. I'm going to shoot just straight from the hip here. I, I would not care if there was still just 50 people here on a Sunday morning. If those 50 people were genuinely growing in their faith and in the knowledge of God. Now, combine that, because that's happening, with also growing in numbers. And, uh, and that's just, that, that is, pff, my, mind, my mind just gets blown every time. I look around on Sunday mornings as I'm preaching and I go, God, it's so awesome that that man is here, that that woman is here, that those kids are here. And all this is going on in my mind as I'm preaching. Yes, I don't know how it happens, but it happens. Um, yeah, but we give thanks. And, and I, every prayer meeting on Wednesday night, I mean, I do this every day, but together as a church, we pray. We pray that God would continue to grow us uh, as believers, that God would continue to grow this church. Do we need to be growing in number all the time? Well, I'm going to say this. We're not about numbers. But if we're effective in our ministry in the Word of God, if we're actually living out our faith, this is going to be the result. We're not chasing after filling these pews. We're chasing after maturing believers and growing believers uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and that is happening. So y'all, praise God. One year down, plenty, plenty, plenty more to go, Lord willing. I'm thankful once again a year later to be able to stand here and uh, open the Word of God. We just finished the book of James. So, contrary to how I usually preach, um, those of you who attend, you know, we'll usually start at the beginning of a book, and we're going to meticulously, as best we can, work our way through that, digging out uh, every bit of nugget that we can that is in there. Um, we just finished the book of James, and next week, we're going to be starting our way through the book of Ecclesiastes. Everybody ever read through the book of Ecclesiastes? It's a fantastic book in the Old Testament. Other than prayer meeting and Sunday nights, it's going to be our first book together uh, in the Old Testament on Sunday morning. So that's going to be next week. Um, we were going to have a special guest speaker next week with us, and that has fallen through. So... We're going to start next week instead of the week after that. But this morning, we're going to do a little bit of a transitional sermon together, uh, study together in preparation um, for tonight and also for the rest of our lives, I believe. Uh, I started this study last month at the Worship in the Valley night. And I, as I was studying out, I just wanted to share a little bit of it last month. Um, but God's really been impressing it on my heart to, to spend more time in this together. But I think there is truth to say that in many circles, many of us are, are wrong or at best confused about what I'm going to speak on this morning, what the true meaning, definition, and practice 
of this subject. I'm talking about worship. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when someone says worship? You don't have to answer out loud, but what's the first thing that comes to your mind when someone says worship? Be thinking about that. Um, I'm really thankful because this is a topic that um, I believe is, is crucial to understanding the Christian life. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll go and venture out um, to say that as a result of my understanding of, of the, the, the work that Christ has done for us and in us, that this is one of the most important aspects of the Christian life. And I also believe that, that if we don't know particular things about God, about who He is, what He is like, about His Word, uh, that we can't properly live according to it. So it's important for us to study it. I think so. Anyway. And I'm just glad that... Um, I can share these things that God has, has been teaching me with you all. So, it's not our only is it our primary function as a church to worship. Um, we're going to touch on that, but, but it's a command on all of my life as a believer. It's a command on all of my life as a believer. There's a lot to be said about worship. There's a lot in culture, in church culture, about worship wars that, that typically refer to music, um, but there's a lot to be said. I don't even think we're going to crack the surface. We could probably put a whole series together about this. We may sometime, uh, but I want to share what God has laid on my heart and this kind of worship in a nutshell, a uh, bit of a sermon, but let's journey together as best we can with uh, the time we've got left, try and deepen our understanding and our knowledge of worship. We're going to look at it at two major aspects as we move along, the first is, is worship as an internal experience. That would be number one. Worship as an internal experience. And the second one that we're going to look at a little bit later is worship as an external expression. So worship as an internal experience. Where does it come from? And number two, worship as an external expression. What does it look like? So, I know we do this a lot. Well, let's pray again. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Teach us what we do not know. Help us to see Jesus as the center of all things. Help us to focus our attention on you, Father. The, the bigger we see your majesty, the better we see your greatness, the more easily we'll fall to our knees in worship. Teach us from your word, I pray this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So, turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 22. You're going to like this morning, I, I got all fancy and I put some slides together. I'm really branching out. Revelation chapter 22. Starting at verse 8. I don't intend to actually, you know, exposit or expound this verse or any of the other verses we're going to be touching on as much as it is just to glean uh, the theme and the teaching aspect of it. Revelation 22, starting at verse 8. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow slave with you, your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. Who are those who keep the words of this book? You, me, believers in Christ. Worship. God. God wants us to hear this specific command. Worship God. The angel says to John, after everything he had seen and witnessed, okay, so John has this vision that the whole book of Revelation is this beautifully rich and often misunderstood and, and very kind of overwhelming book of the Bible. Let's just be real. You start to read that stuff, you're like, what? in the world is that. Now, I'm going to say this. It's very important for us to know what we believe in and why. 
It's very important for us to, to take the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 and to accept it all as God's revelation, as God's word. I'm also going to say this. We can get so caught up in the book of Revelation with, with questions and concerns and, and, and all of these things that, that distract us from, from living properly Christian uh, living today. I think that we can get so caught up that we miss the point altogether. It's important to know. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not. But don't let yourself distracted by future things to the point where you forget to live today in the place where God has you. The book of Revelation will, will say things that will blow your mind. That's because we have a God who is so great that he will blow your mind for sure. What the angel is saying in response, he's saying to John, John is so overwhelmed at what he's seen that he falls down to his knees to worship. His natural response and reaction to all he's just seen of the revelation of God that he falls down to worship. It's like this uncontrollable response. But he's doing it to the angel who showed him all these things. The angel says, don't do that. I'm, I'm a fellow servant of yours and of the prophets, and of all those who are going to obey the words of this book. I'm, I'm, I'm no greater than you. Don't worship me. Worship God. In other words, don't worship angels. Don't worship nothing. Don't worship uh, man-made things. Don't neglect God. Don't despise God. Worship God. This is the last chapter of the Bible, and this is the last duty of man. When you read in the Westminster Catechism when it says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever, that's a lifestyle of worship. It's not surprising to me to find that this is the last command in these last few verses of the Bible because uh, according to Revelation 4, which we're going to look at, and Romans chapter 12, the reason we exist in the first place, y'all, is for our whole lives to be an offering of worship to God. It's interesting that it comes so far into the New Testament, and here's why. Because we'll find that in the New Testament, uh, as a whole, there's this incredible indifference, there's this amazing degree of indifference, to worship as being an outward ritual or practice. But there's this, this radical emphasis of worship as an inward experience of the heart. Great indifference to worship as an outward ritual or practice. So if you're thinking, okay, there's more uh, to, to, to worshiping than coming to church to a worship service, to singing and music and raising my hands, yes. End of sermon. You can go home. In fact, turn a few pages back to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verses 9 to 11. Revelation, if you're still looking, is the last book of the Bible. Revelation 4, verses 9 to 11. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and and ever they cast their crowns before the throne saying worthy are you o our lord and god to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and are created there's this deep even in heaven there's this deep expression of of, of humility of heart a reverence for who and what god is God, God is almighty. God is sovereign, creator of everything. Listen, here's another plug for prayer meeting. Wednesday nights, we've been studying together about who God is and the attributes of God. And it's been opening our, our eyes to, to how great, and I don't mean how, man, God is great, into the greatness, this, this vast, huge, amazing God that, that, we, that we are so blessed to be able to call Father. That 
the expression begins with a humility of heart. They look to him who lives forever and ever. They fall down and worship him. Let's define worship a little bit. Uh, For that, I want you to turn back to Romans chapter 12. Romans is one of the richest books of the Bible, I think. Romans chapter 12, if you're using a pew Bible, that would be page 1045. You'll find this appeal that comes from Paul to a a life of personal worship. All right, so verse 1, Romans chapter 12. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you, I appeal to you, I beseech you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship, to present all that I am, Every ounce of my being, physical, spiritual, as an act of worship, is not just the best thing to do, Paul writes, in response to who and what Jesus is and did for me, it's the only logical thing to do. That's what Paul is writing when he says, this is, this is your spiritual worship. Other translations use lines like, this is your true and proper worship. Worship, or, or which is your reasonable service. One version actually says, this is your intelligent service. When I start to grasp a better knowledge of, of who God is and what he's like, <clears throat> this is a, a natural response. It's the only way of living that makes sense. Not in, in a habitual, unchecked sin. Not in a way that, that my lips will say on Sunday that I'm a Christian, but my life He's saying, by the mercies of God, for God's sake, may the transformation that's taken place in my heart as you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ transform you from the inside out. The New Living Translation quotes it this way. It's probably my favorite. This is truly the way to worship him. This is truly the way to worship him. Not merely ritual activity, which Sunday morning can become, but the constant involvement of heart, mind, and will, all right? To be in awe of the Creator in all things that the lover of my soul has made and done. I love the word awe. Paul Tripp wrote a little book called Awe. I encourage you to pick it up and take a look. Why it matters for everything we say, think, and do. Awe. He writes this in this book. He says, God created an awesome world. God intentionally loaded the world with amazing things to leave you astounded. The carefully air-conditioned termite mound in Africa, the tart crunchiness of an apple, the explosion of thunder, the beauty of an orchid, the interdependent system of the human body, the inexhaustible pounding of the ocean waves, and thousands of other created sights, sounds, touches, and tastes. God designed all to be awesome. And he intended you to be daily amazed. But if awesome things in creation become your God, the God who created those things will not own your awe. Horizontal awe is meant to do one thing, stimulate vertical. Horizontal awe is meant to do one thing, stimulate vertical. Harold Best, in his book, Music Through the Eyes of Faith, defines worship like this, kind of a broad sense, but he says, worship is acknowledging that someone or something else is greater than I, worth more, and by consequence to be obeyed, feared, and adored. Worship is the sign that in giving myself completely to someone or something, listen, I want to be mastered by it. Turn back into the Old Testament to Psalm 115. This is where I was just chatting with the children about. Psalm 115, we're going to read from verses 1 to 8. Page 555, Psalm 115. Psalmist writes, not to us, O Lord, not to us, 
But to your name give glory because of your faithful love, because of your truth. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven and does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throats. Those who make them are just like them as are all those who trust in them. Or we can just listen to the iPad reading. That works, I do that all the time. We are mastered by the object of our worship. We are mastered by the objects of our worship. We worship whatever rules our time, whatever rules our energy, whatever rules our thoughts, whatever rules our desires, whatever rules our longings, whatever rules our choices. Ed Welsh says, whatever wins our affection will control our lives. Whatever wins our affection will control our lives. You might think, why spend so much time defining worship? Is it really that big a deal? Well, if we're honest, um, it's hard for us to know whether or not we're doing something right if we're not sure what that something is, right? If I define eating simply as looking at food, you wouldn't be very excited about coming over to our house to eat, right? Theologian and author David Peterson says, defining words is important because not only do we use words, but words use us. That's true. Even, uh, e- even if we're unaware of it, using once we assign a meaning to a word, it both reflects and shapes our view of it or our, our worldview altogether. So it's important for us to understand what we mean as a church when we speak of worship. That's why conversations about things like being evangelical or, or even things about the church or Christianity can be confusing because different people have different definitions of what those words are. We have to agree on what those words actually mean in order to make sense of them, in order for us to stand on a truth that we want to claim and live by. Worship is one of those words. When someone was for, refers to worship, uh, they can mean, uh, they can be talking about a lot of different things. That's why I asked the question earlier, what's the, what comes to your mind when someone says the word worship? It could be a time of singing, it could be a meeting, it could be a style of music, certain religious service, uh, mystical experience for some. Something in contrast to praise, you know, we got praise and worship music. I don't know if it's either or or, or both. Or a type of Christian band, you know, they're a worship band, or this is a worship team. On that note, on a Sunday morning, you're all the worship team. Those thoughts, okay, misconceptions of, of, of maybe not misconceptions, but maybe a narrow view of what worship truly is, um, they're often expressed in comments like these, okay? So I put a few up there for us to see. You can just put the first one up there, Matt. About worship, oh man, by the third song, I was really worshiping. Which begs the question, who or what were you worshiping before the third song? The next one, worship gets me to the place where I don't have to think about anything. Sounds really noble, uh, but it ought to be quite the opposite. Worshiping God actually requires thinking very clearly and deeply about who he is, about his word, about his works, about his worthiness, not thinking about anything else. Next one. Wow, that, that's, I just picked Sally because there wasn't a Sally in the church. I didn't want everybody to be offended. That's Sally. She's a true worshiper. Well, what you probably mean by that is, is Sally is expressive in her worship. You probably see her or him, there's a dude named Sally, put his hands up in church and not be afraid to be expressive. It's probably what that thought, whatever it means, um, if she's a true worshiper of God, requires more questions than just what we observe on a Sunday morning. Lastly, and my favorite, man, with only 10 minutes of singing this morning, we really didn't get to worship. I've heard that one. 
it's like, it's like as though we need to warm up, you know, to get to where God wants us to be, rather than to seek to honor him with every thought and every action in our lives. 1 Corinthians 10.31, you don't have to turn there. be a familiar passage to some of you. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, okay? In whatever you do, worship God. 1 Corinthians 10.31, highlight that verse right now if you do that in your Bible. In whatever you do, worship God. Your job, your school, your role as a husband or wife, father or mother, or single, whatever you do, worship God. How can I worship God by, by eating, Pastor Matt? We give thanks to the provider of all things. And I'm going to try my best to see food as God intended for it to be, as nourishment and fuel to my body. How can I worship God by going to the movies? That's a great question. <laughs> be very selective in the movies you choose to see. Now, am I saying that 24 hours a day, I sit in my office in complete contemplation and worship? Um, no. But I seek daily to be in a place through the meditation of God's word that all, all my attention and all my affection and all my, my thoughts are, are either a reflection of what I believe God is teaching me or either pointed to God or from God, even in my conversations with people. God at the center creates a life and lifestyle that reflects him. And when God is at the center of my life, when the word of God is paramount, when the gospel is clear to me and in me, everything I do, whatever I do, brings glory and honor to God because it's an act of worship, Romans chapter 12. Whatever you do. Now, please don't misunderstand those, those quotes and comments. I'm not encouraging anybody to become a, a word police. There are a few things more obnoxious than someone who misses the main point of what you're trying to say because they're just fixed on certain words. My wife tells me I can be that guy sometimes. Sorry. However, thinking and speaking of worship more broadly and biblically will both clarify some of our discussion um, about it, and I believe more importantly, it's going to continue to, to constantly drive me to be passionate uh, about God and, and to live a life that, that is honoring and actions in all of my life. Remember Romans chapter 12, he's saying your whole life, everything about you is a living sacrifice. I think one of the hardest things, you've probably heard this quote before, is not to be willing to die for God, but to be willing to live every day for in all of my life, to honor him with my actions. This is truly the way to worship him. We too often hear the singing time referred to as worship. Now that statement can be misleading because um, we're unintentionally saying that this part of the service is worship and the rest may not be. I want to encourage you this morning to understand that even as you sit and hear these words, that is an act of worship, but it starts in your heart. How are you hearing the word of God? How are you responding to the word of God? It's all worship. Except for maybe the announcements. Whoever invented announcements? I just want to cut those out altogether. Music is an important part of worship. I'm not, listen, I'm not just singling music out, but it's an incredibly important part of corporate worship. Worship, as we sing to God, as we sing to each other, as we sing about God, as we sing about who we are. But it's not, nor has it ever been, the only way to worship. All of my mind, all of my emotions and will and actions focused on God and the work of Jesus Christ, that is biblical worship. I think, man, that's like a huge order. Like, how can I, how can I get there? 
Without help, you can't. How we need God's help to do this. We would love to do this on our own, to just sit down and focus, uh, but the reality is we need God's help. And to get there, we must begin with prayer. God, help me to see you for who you truly are. God, help me to live my life according to your word. Because when you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God has indwelled you, God says, I have given you the power to obey. I've given you the power to live with joy in the commands that I've given you. We need God's help. Harold Best wrote a book called Unceasing Worship. He writes, we begin with one fundamental fact about worship. At this very moment, and for as long as the world endures, everybody inhibiting it is bowing down and serving something or someone, an artifact, a person, an institution, an idea, a spirit, or God through Christ, or God through Christ. Everyone is being shaped thereby and is growing up towards some measure of fullness, whether of righteousness or of evil. Everyone worships something, bottom line. What they worship can be debated. How they worship can be debated. But everyone is an unceasing worshiper. Let that sink in for a second. Everyone is an unceasing worshiper. Maybe you worship your job. Maybe you worship your wife, your kids. Make all my, my life revolve around those things. Maybe I worship money. My thoughts are consumed by this thing or person. My, my attention is consumed by this thing or person. God says you are constantly worshiping. What you're worshiping is the question. And it's leading you either to righteousness or evil. Fun fact, worship happens in the heart every day and all the time. So if you actually study through the New Testament, you'll find worship is being significantly deinstitutionalized, okay, delocalized and deritualized. The whole thrust is being taken off ceremony and, and places. It's being shifted uh, to what is happening in my heart. Not just on Sundays, but every day and all the time with all of my life. This is what it means when you read things like in 1 Corinthians, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And then Colossians chapter 3 says a lot of the same things. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. This is the form of worship commanded in the New Testament, to act in a way that reflects how I value the glory of God. Okay, so listen close. This is stepping way beyond paying lip service to the fact that I'm a Christian. To do anything and everything in the name of Jesus with thanks to God. How I deal with my wife with my kids, with my parents, with my boss, with my coworkers, how I view my job, how I view my roles, all through the lens of Jesus Christ. This is the basic form of living worship, Romans chapter 12. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip forward a little bit, but... What is overflowing in my heart will make its way out, right? Now, there are no doubt visible expressions of worship, and that's beautiful. Listen, I, I can drive down the road listening to songs and singing, and I raise my hands, and I've got to grab the wheel again real quick. Uh, but there's no doubt visible expressions of worship. Even if it's not what I'm into or I'm not comfortable with, somebody, some people pass it off as, you know, that's just a church culture style. Well, that's partly true. But what is happening in your heart when it comes to God is something that sometimes I cannot contain. That's how great and big my God is. 
Over 30 times you'll read in the Bible, at least 30 times, about raising hands in praise to God. Somebody could have a legit argument to stand up here and preach and tell you you are commanded to lift your hands and praise. And you'd go, this is a Baptist church, son. Well, we are. <laughs> we sing songs sometimes that go, lift my hands and praise you. And we just, like this. Or, or shout and clap. And we just, I'm not saying do these things because, you know, we're saying them. But if it's in your heart, if it's in your heart, and I, and I truly grasp the work that Christ has done in me, and, and I at least get a, a glimpse of the greatness and majesty of God, how can I not? I'm, I'm just being serious. How, how can I not? Sometimes we're just like, <laughs> I had a lady one time say to me, I love this lady. You know, I, I, I was like this close. I was like this close this morning. You know, I was like with the toe tap. And I just, I just felt like I was going to go. And I was like, just go. Just get there, you know. Like I'm not, don't, not making you do anything. But I'm saying if I don't have a problem with people who don't raise their hands or who do raise your hands. Where I have a problem is if you really feel like you want to express the, the worship that is in you, you want to express that with an outward expression, and you go, what are people going to think of me? And we're all worshiping God. We're all worshiping God. That's, that's what our goal is on a Sunday morning anyway. But even with that, it's not where worship begins. Because, like Sally, just because I raise my hands does not mean I'm a true worshiper. Very little time to look at number two, which we're just kind of start a little bit, the external expression of worship. Another definition of worship that I appreciate for its simplicity is by Warren Wiersbe, and he writes, worship is the believer's response of all that they are, mind, emotions, will, and body, to all of what God is, says, and does. I love that definition because um, it exposes that worship can't be half-hearted and is all about God's character. It's not about me. Turn to John chapter 4, and I'm really not going to do a good job at explaining this because I've got like less than 10 minutes. John chapter 4. Last summer, I, I was sick on a Sunday morning, and John spoke, and he had touched on this subject, on this passage. Um, look at verses 19 to 26 with me. John chapter 4, page 979. This is a story of, of, of Jesus and the, the Samaritan woman. Um, Verse 19, sir, the woman says, I see that you are a prophet. And she asks him a question. Our father is worshipped on this mountain. She's actually trying to distract him from the point that he knows everything about her and she's getting a little freaked out. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our father is worshipped on this mountain. Yet you Jews say that the place of worship is in Jerusalem. She's like, you know, which one is it, God? Jesus says, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and and in truth. So in this beautiful exchange between Jesus and this woman, um, Jesus is, is loosening worship from its outward and location-based connotation. I got to go to church to worship. God, where do we worship? Is it that church or is it this church? You know, I just showed up in Machias and there's like 17 churches. Which church do I go to to worship? Whichever church is truly worshiping God truly preaching the word of God. It's not about that place or this place. The Father is seeking worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. Here's the key sentence. True worship, which has been anticipated from ages past, has arrived. He says, verse 22, the hour is coming in ages to come and now is here, here in me, Jesus says. What marks this true worship 
is that instead of being in this mountain or in Jerusalem, it's in spirit and in truth. What Jesus is doing here is he's completely stripping worship from any traces of outward connotation. Not that it would be wrong to worship in a place. Listen, Acts chapter 20 tells us on the first day of the week they gathered to worship. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 teaches us and encourages us and admonishes us, do not neglect the gathering together to worship. We know it's important to meet together in corporate worship, but Jesus is simply making this explicit, central, that this is not what makes worship worship. What makes worship worship is what is happening in spirit and in truth with or without a place or building. So then, real quick, what do those two phrases mean in spirit and in truth? In spirit, verse 24, simply means that this true worship, this is what I was saying earlier, we need God's help. This true worship is carried along and led by the Holy Spirit. And is continually, um, and, and it's happening mainly as an inward spiritual event, not mainly as an outward bodily event. So in spirit and in truth means that true worship is a response to true views of God and is shaped and guided by true views of God. Now listen, true views of God can't help but manifest themselves outwardly. The outward expression of worship is the expressive response to what has happened and is happening in the heart of the believer. What you think of God will directly shape if or how you worship him. Think about that. What you think about God, what you think of God will directly shape if or how you worship him and not your man-made idols, not these other priorities. This is what Jesus meant in Matthew 15 verses 8 and 9 when he said, these people, these people honor me with their mouth and they show up at church, they talk a good talk. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. Matthew 15, 8 and 9. When the heart is far from God, worship is vain, empty, non-existent. The experience of the heart is is the defining and, and vital essence to worship. A heart truly changed by Jesus Christ has at the forefront of its desire to worship and serve the one who redeemed it, okay? At the heart, a person whose life has truly been changed by Jesus Christ will have at the forefront of their desire to worship and serve the one who redeemed it. So, I have one video I want to show you real quick, and then I'm going to wrap up. Pay close attention. It's brief. Sound is a little mucky. Go. Oh, it's muted. Unmute it. Unmute it. Begin it again. Pause it. Begin it again. Technology. No, that's going to be wicked loud. Is it muted at top? This was, this was my punchline. Try her again. Ah. All right, so this is a really cheesy video of Victoria Osteen who says something along the lines of, forget the video, it's not going to work. Don't worry about it. You're all still looking at the screen, so I'm just going to wait. Can you close it, Matthew? Hey, okay. Awesome. So this is just a video of Victoria Osteen encouraging a congregation of about 20,000 people to just do good for their own sake. She says, and I quote, when you come to church, when you worship God, you're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for your own sake because that's what makes God happy. When you do good for your own sake, that's what makes 
God happy. Amen? Get out. Listen, that's blasphemy. There's nothing biblical about that. If you said amen, it's just because you didn't hear what I said. That's wrong, right? That's wrong, right? Listen, we would never say that, and I would never say that in church. Man, you don't come to church to worship God. We come to church for us. Forget God. This is about me and you being good. We wouldn't say that, but without realizing it, when I let myself fall into places like, you know, I'm not going to church today because I don't like the music or it's too loud or it's too dull or I don't like the preacher. He preaches too long. Yeah, I'm already there. Um, I don't like giving money all that much. He prays too much, too long. I can't stand it. I don't get anything out of church today. The underlying heart in those thoughts agrees with that video. It's making worship and church and God all about me and not about God at all. Is it wrong to have preferences? No, I have preferences. I can dislike every song or every aspect of a church service and still worship God. I could even disagree with others on, on doctrinal beliefs from within the church or even outside the congregation and still be able to worship God together. Because worship is the outpouring to God of what is in my heart already, not what I expect will be put there when I get to church. Understand? If you show up to church expecting to eventually get into a spirit of worship, you're missing the point altogether. We do come to church to worship together. But if spirit of worship is, is in my heart already, I'm not, I'm not coming to get anything out of church. I'm coming to give all of myself, which is my reasonable act of worship, which is my logical act of worship to offer all that I am. I leave you with this. It can be hard to focus all that I am all of the time on worshiping God. So ask for help. Pray. Think about Jesus. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've been granted salvation through faith in the real physical death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not, I'm not talking about just knowing a lot about him. I'm talking about truly knowing him. And through that knowledge, you will know and understand uh, the nature of this radical, authentic, inward experience we call worship. And how it is that this experience comes to expression in gathered congregations, but more importantly, in my everyday life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, to present my life in gratitude of all that Christ has done for me, to be a, a a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy as God is holy in all that I do, to give up all of my heart, my body, and my soul to be in awe of him who died for me. This is my reasonable act of worship, from singing to listening to the preaching to praying to parenting to eating to working with integrity to dating and all I do, do all the glory of God. And that's my poor attempt. I try to explain worship. Father, thank you that you even, that you even put up with, with worship from peddly creatures like us. We look around at the, the vastness of your creation and the amazing things we see that leave us in awe all the time. God, teach us Remind us that these, these things that we are in awe of here horizontally are meant to give us vertical awe of you. And that's the spirit of worship. God, thank you for Jesus. 
Thank you for the salvation that he grants us, forgiveness of sins through faith in him. God, that's all grace. There's nothing we could ever do to earn any ounce of your grace and goodness. But you just pour it on those who believe. Thank you for that. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We'll just sing one verse and chorus of this, and then you'll be dismissed.